Hi, welcome back. A few weeks ago, I talked about disclosures. And I talked in particular about what I call the disclosure dilemma. What's the dilemma? Over the last few decades, our disclosures have become bulkier and bulkier. Annual reports, filings with the SEC, prospectuses. But at the same time, they've somehow managed to become less informative. I argued that some of this disclosure opacity or complexity was because of the law of unintended consequences, where people with the best of intentions push for more disclosures in a particular dimension, but after a while, these disclosures piled up to drown us in them. The other I argued was deliberate, where companies were deliberately adding to disclosures and making them more complex and less readable so that we'd miss the big picture. In this session, I want to talk about ways out of the disclosure dilemma. So let's think about the disease. The disease is very simple. If you look at annual filings, not just in the US, but across the world from companies, or prospectus from initial public offerings, they're getting bigger and bigger, more bulky. They're at the same time also becoming less readable, more complex. And you have this sense that companies are mixing up big disclosures, disclosures with large consequences for the company, with small disclosures little or no effect and after a while as an investor you're losing your way you're missing the forest for the trees the net effect of course is that investors feel more confused than they used to be before those disclosures came into being which is ironic given that many of these disclosures were ostensibly to make investors better informed so let's think about why this might be happening one reason I think disclosures are becoming more bulky is you have interest groups that are pushing more and more for their particular data item to be reported. And they're being aided and assisted by technology that allows companies, allows people to collect data at a much more granular level than you used to be able to do 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago. Data we couldn't have dreamed of collecting decades ago is now collectible. And finally, companies have learned a very important lesson, I think, from lawyers, which is if you want to drown something of significance, just add on a lot of insignificant items to disclosures and the net effect is going to be the same. There are three other reasons, I think, also for the disclosure bloat. One is, I think, the prevailing orthodoxy, which is that disclosures need to be one size fits all. It's driven by a sense of fairness, which is it's unfair to ask some companies to disclose data without asking other companies as well. So the general rule seems to be everybody has to report everything. There are, of course, carve outs to this rule over time. I mean, oil companies are required to report their you know, undeveloped viable reserves and only they have to do it. Financial service companies have to report on their regulatory capital and loan default rates, but they tend to be exceptions. The second problem, I think, with the way disclosures have evolved over time is the accounting definition of materiality. Now, I agree that we should be reporting only material information. I don't think you're going to get much pushback on that. The real question, though, is how do we define material? I think the way accountants have defined it, not naturally, is built around accounting earnings. If something has a material effect on accounting earnings, it needs to be reported. The third is that disclosure rule writers often tend to also be in the disclosure business. I don't mean to be cynical, but if you're an accounting firm or an accountant sitting on an accounting rule writing board, your inclination is going to be to add to disclosure because the more you add to disclosure, the more work there is for accountants to have to do to disclose that data. So what now? What can we do? How do we es escape the disclosure uh, trap? I'm going to argue that there are three things we can do to make disclosures slimmer and more informative as we go through time. The first is we need to revisit this notion of one size fits all. We need to tailor disclosures more closely to the company reporting them and allow for differences in disclosure rules across companies. The second is we need to redefine materiality, not in terms of earnings, but in terms of value. What that's going to do almost immediately is to shift the focus away from reporting things that affected the past to reporting things that will affect the future. Finally, I'm going to argue for what I call triggered disclosures, which is when a company makes contentions, claims about its future, tells a story, 
there's nothing preventing companies from doing it. They're also then required to reveal more information based on their storytelling. I'm going to use this in the context of IPO so you can see exactly how this plays out. But let's take these three, these three particular principles in place. First, I don't think one size fits all. The originally when disclosure rules were written in the 1930s, that might have made sense because companies might have been more homogeneous. And while segments, as I pointed out, be allowed to carve out disclosure rules, in general, most disclosure rules apply to all companies. So one idea for this carve out is this triggered disclosure that we will talk about, but we need to basically customize disclosures. Second, materiality. Much of materiality is built upon the principle of does it affect earnings? In fact, there are rules floating around. If the effect on earnings is more than X percent, 3 percent or 5 percent, it's material. But then we make the mistake of leaving this choice in the hands of accountants. There's nothing wrong with accountants, but accountants tend to be naturally conservative. Put simply, it is safer for an accountant to assume that something is material and reported, even if it's not, than to do the opposite, which is to assume it's immaterial and it turns out to be material, which means there's going to be a predisposition to report far more than you need to. As I said, I think we need to shift the materiality de definition away from earnings to value. What is value driven by? It's driven by future earnings, future cash flows, which means that those items that can affect future earnings and cash flow should be given front and center place in disclosure. And those items that have an effect only on past earnings should be diluted, should be reduced. There is a third thing that we can do to make disclosures more relevant, more useful. And that is the notion of triggered disclosures. If you're saying, what? A triggered disclosure is tailored to a company's makeup and valuation story. So you tell me a story as a company and what the basis for your value is. I'm going to argue that the disclosures have to be tied to that basis. Just as an example, there are many companies out there that claim that brand name is at the core of the value. Whether that's true or not, that's their claim. If that is your contention, and I, could, I would argue that companies like Coca-Cola and Kraft Heinz are good examples, then you should be required to review far more information on that dimension. And basically what I mean by that is we need certain items to value brand name, things like margins and how different those margins are from generic companies. And you should be required to reveal that as part of your disclosures. But at the same time, if you're the kind of company that doesn't put brand names front and center, in fact, you have no pretensions about brand name driving value, why should you be required to reveal all of those details? So what I'd like to do is apply these principles in a segment of the market, initial public offerings. And here's the reason I'm going to focus on them. This is a space where disclosures clearly seem to have lost their way. Just as an example, Apple and Microsoft, the highest profile IPOs of the 1980s, had prospectuses. A prospectus, of course, is the filing you make at the time of a public offering, had prospectus of less than 100 pages. In contrast, Airbnb and DoorDash, IPOs from the last two years, have had prospectuses above 400 pages. Prospectuses have become much bulkier. And at the same time, investors feel more confused than ever before in valuing young companies because they seem to be hitting markets as unformed companies. Companies with big revenues, but big losses and unformed business models. So as we think about initial public offerings and how we need to, dis how disclosures need to evolve here, I think what we've talked about, especially in the context of triggered disclosure applies especially to initial public offerings. So what I'd like to do with initial public offerings is look at the company and every company going public tells a story about its future since its value lies entirely in the future. These stories can be very different. If you're a subscriber based company, you're talking about how big your subscription base is going to be and how much you're going to charge for subscriptions. If you're a transaction based company, you might talk about how active customers are on your platform. If you're a fintech company, you might talk about the potential disruption you bring to the financial service company. But each company going public often tells a very different story about where its value is coming from. 
I'm going to draw on a paper that I co-wrote with Dan McCarthy and Maxime Cohen, who know a lot more about customer evaluation than I do, about what you would need to know about these companies, subscription-based, transaction-based, fintech companies, to be able to value them better, and then to tailor disclosures to require information on that dimension. In other words, I'm saying you open the door by telling a story. I'm going to walk in and demand more details on that story. So let's take a few places where this is going to play out. Almost every big IPO of the last decade, one of the key items that this company markets itself on is how big the potential market is. It's called a total addressable market or a TAM. Now, in this graph, for instance, you see Uber's TAM from its prospectors and Airbnb's TAM from its prospectors. And you can see why these numbers dazzle investors. Airbnb in 2000, I'm sorry, Uber in 2019 contended that its total addressable market was $5.2 trillion. Airbnb in 2020 claimed that its total addressable market was $3.4 trillion. You're saying, so what? Well, the car service market, which is where Uber was primarily in 2019, is a fraction of the $5.2 trillion. The hotel business that Airbnb was disrupting was about $600 billion, not $3.4 trillion. So clearly, companies are pushing these big numbers out, and they're doing it for a reason. Investors are dazzled by the size of these markets, and these companies are hoping to get much higher valuations as a consequence. Now, I have no problem with companies pushing out total addressable markets, but if you make that the centerpiece for your prospectus, it's a central part of your story, then I think it has to come in with additional information that will allow me to judge whether your total addressable market is a dream or an achievable reality. One thing that all companies should be reporting in addition to a total addressable market is actually a serviceable addressable market. Or put differently, what's your market size today? Forget about what your dream market looks like, but how big is your market today? Now that should be, that, that's called a SAM, or a serviceable addressable market, should be much smaller than a total addressable market. And you should now also tell me how you get from your SAM to your TAM. So if your serviceable addressable market today is a half a trillion, and you claim it's going to be five trillion in 10 years, you need to talk about what bridges allow you to get from a half a trillion to five trillion rather than just throw the five trillion out there. Second, if you let companies just provide the total addressable market, obviously they're going to give you the biggest number they can think of. If you provide a total addressable market, then I think as a company you have an obligation to at least give your estimates of what share of that market you expect to get. You know why this is going to help? If you're required to show a share of that market, then I can hold you accountable. Each year I can look at what percentage of that market you're actually delivering and say, you know what, you claimed you'd get 15% of the market. I don't think you're going to get past 5%. So if you, if you bring in total addressable market, then you also have to talk about your expected market share. And this is a number that can't be one time. In other words, you can't just report it as part of your prospectus and then forget about it, which is what a lot of companies seem to do. You now have an obligation because you made it such a big part of your story to give me ongoing metrics on what's happening to your total addressable market as you go through time. What I'm trying to do here is not stop companies from reporting total addressable market, but are arguing that there needs to be accountability. Let's move on to subscription-based companies, companies like Netflix, right? Where their basis for value is we have a big customer base, we have a big subscriber base, and that base is growing. But you're talking about valuing this company based on their subscribers. Now, any subscription-based company can be valued based on its subscribers, broken down into two groups. One is existing subscribers. And the value of an existing subscriber comes from first determining how long a subscriber will stay a subscriber. To make that judgment, I need to know about renewal rates and churn rates. In other words, what percentage of the subscribers renew and how many do, do you drop off? That allows me to get an expected life for the subscriber and to try to estimate cash flows over that life. Those cash flows are going to come from the subscription revenues from the subscribers, net of whatever cost you need to service that subscription. It's called a marginal contribution. 
So to value an existing subscriber, I need to have a life, an expected life for the subscriber, cash flows over the life, and a measure of how much uncertainty there is in those cash flows. That will allow me to value existing subscriber base. But of course, many of these companies are growth companies that expect to add to their subscriber base. So I need to value new subscribers. The value of a new subscriber will come from all of the variables that drive the value of an existing subscriber, the subscription revenues, the marginal contribution, etc. But you need one additional key input, which is what does it cost you to acquire a subscriber? Now, sometimes this might take the form of discounts you allow subscribers, where they're allowed to get the subscription for free for three months or six months. Others, it might be a promotional cost of a different kind, but I need the cost of acquiring a subscriber. That allows me to value new subscribers you might add over time. Now think of the information subscription-based companies would need to give you to be able to value existing and new subscribers. First, at the very minimum, they need to give you subscription count over time, right? You need to know the number of subscribers because without the number of subscribers, the whole process breaks down. Most subscription-based companies do report the existing count. You also need a measure of what's called subscriber churn or renewal. What percentage of subscribers renew? That's a key input. It's amazing how many subscription-based companies don't provide this basic input. Netflix, for instance, in recent years hasn't provided any measure of churn or renewal. Third, you got to give me not just what you charge a subscriber as subscription fees, but what your contribution profit is, what the costs are of servicing a subscription. Fourth, I need to know not just how many subscribers you have each year, but so which is what many companies report is the net subscription count. I'd like to know how many new subscribers you added and how many dropped off. In other words, there's a big difference between a company that has 10 million subscribers that adds 2 million subscribers in a year to go from 10 to 12. And another company that started with the same 10 million, but added 10 million new subscribers and lost 8 million. They both will end up with 12 million as net subscription count, but a very different valuations. I think it makes sense if you're a subscription based company that you become explicit about the cost of acquiring subscribers. I know you're going to do a lot of hand waving and say it's difficult to do, but the reality is this is a number you should be tracking internally and reporting externally. And finally, as um, Dan, Dan McCarthy and, um, uh, and Peter Fader have pointed out very elo eloquently, to value subscription-based companies, you need information on cohorts. What does that mean? I need to know what your renewal rates are, not just collectively on your subscription base, but broken down by when your subscribers became subscribers. The rationale being older subscribers might be more loyal ones, so you have a lower drop-off rate than younger subscribers. It's called a cohort table. And just to give you an example of how a cohort table would work, this is a cohort table from Slack. It actually breaks down the, the, the Slack's customers based on when they became Slack customers, 2015, 2016, 2017. Cohort tables can provide you information on the behavior of subscribers as they stay on your platform. Do they become more loyal? less loyal. Do they spend more money, less money? That's useful to know and central to valuing a subscription-based company. What about transaction-based companies? Let me start off with a statement. Transaction-based companies are more difficult to value than subscription-based companies and here's why. A Netflix subscriber, we have a pretty good sense of what the revenues are going to be from that Netflix subscriber. In contrast, if you're an Uber rider, it's much more problematic and here's why. It's transaction-based. You can be an Uber rider and take only one ride a month or 50 rides a month. So there's much more variation in how much revenue you make per rider. And also, there might be much more variation across time, which is if you stay on Uber for four or five or six years, you might take a lot more rides than you did in your first year. So with transaction-based companies, while the structure is the same, the value of the company is the value of existing customers with the value of new customers, the type of information you need might be different and richer. For instance, if you're a transaction-based company, I need to know what your typical customer's transaction revenues are each year, and also how much variation there is across customers. Do 10% of your customers account for 90% of your revenues, or is it more equally distributed? 
I need to know the marginal profit you make on that transaction each year and how active your customers are over time. So in addition to knowing how many customers you have, I need a measure of activity over time and how it changes over time. And of course, the uncertainty here is not just about the number of customers, but how active they are over time. So by its very nature, transaction-based companies are going to be a little riskier than subscription-based companies. As with subscription-based companies, of course, if you're growing, you're adding new customers. I need to know, in addition to the value of that new customer, which is going to be driven by all of the factors that drive the value of an existing customer, how much it costs you to acquire a new customer and how many new customers you expect to have over time. So similar in many ways to a subscription-based model, but richer information. Now, one of the things, um, there, there are three variables in it, in a, with transaction-based companies that I would add as additional information. The first is, um, unlike subscription-based companies where I just count subscribers with transaction-based companies, I need a measure of active customers. Put simply, I mean, there might be 91 million people on the Uber platform but if you never take a ride, are you really on the platform? It's much more difficult to just count a person as being a customer just because they're on your platform. You need a measure of activity. And surprisingly, right now, there is no accepted measure of activity with different companies measuring activity differently. Some companies define activity an active customer is somebody who's placed at least one order during the course of a year. Other companies define it as <laughs> at least one order <coughs> in a three-month period. Second, I need a measure of orders over time because after all, you make money on transactions. So it's not just enough to know how many active customers there are. I need to know the orders that they make, the transactions they make and how it changes over time. And finally, to the extent that you acquire new customers as a transaction-based company with promotionals, big discounts. And these discounts are often hidden in the financial statements because they're shown as less revenues rather than as additional costs. Companies might need to get more explicit about how much promotions cost them. Finally, fintech. I mean, clearly disruption is coming to the financial service business, but it's worth stepping back and thinking about the status quo here. Until the Great Depression, banks operated primarily on self-regulation. So when you think about regulatory capital coming in after the Great Depression, that is true, but pre-Great Depression, prudent banks accumulated capital on their own to protect themselves against a downturn. So financial service companies, since regulation came into place, have been given cut some slack because in a sense, the regulatory authorities are supposed to keep an eye on these companies. But at the same time, since 2008, the information that financial service companies have had to report reflects the concerns that investors have. So if you're a bank and you make loans, you now have to report on the credit quality of those loans as part of your disclosures. You have to report on regulatory capital. So investors will know whether you're undercapitalized or overcapitalized. Ironically, as traditional banks, traditional insurance companies, traditional investment banks have faced increasing needs for disclosure, the fintech companies that are competing with them seem to have evaded this responsibility, at least for the moment. In fact, you could argue that the absence of a regulatory overlay over fintech companies makes disclosure even more critical at these companies because there's nobody keeping an eye on these companies. In fact, one argument for why fintech has taken off is it's playing regulatory arbitrage, which is it's entering spaces where the traditional companies, the status quo is constrained by regulation and it's taking advantage of the fact that it's not regulated. So if you're valuing a fintech company, you need some measures of quality when you look at growth. So if you're an online loan company, then I need to know not just how quickly your loans are growing, but also what the credit quality of those loans are. In addition, as I said, even prior to regulatory capital coming into play, Prudent Bank set aside a capital buffer to cover the downturns that are part of being in the banking business. If you're a fintech company, I need a measure of that capital buffer and whether it's going to be sufficient to cover the next downturn you're going to have. Because if you don't, you might look good. You might look good until you blow up. So I think with fintech companies, I think we're just getting started on disclosure requirements. And because fintech companies cover the spectrum from portfolio management companies to loan companies to payment processing companies to online banks, 
the disclosure rules have to reflect what investors in these companies worry about. And looking at what traditional banks, insurance companies, investment banks have had to go through is, I think, a good starting point. So in conclusion, as data becomes easier to collect and report, our disclosures are getting bigger. And with demands from interest groups pushing up these disclosures, disclosures are going to get only bigger over time, more bulky over time, less informative. So I think that we need to change the way we think about disclosures and nothing else. There are three ways and we've gone over them in this session that you can have your cake and eat it too. First is, I think we need to allow for more customization of disclosure requirements. So rather than one size fits all, fit disclosures to a company's story, its business model. Second, the materiality def de definition has to change to reflect effects on value rather than effects on earnings to shift from the past to the future. And finally, this notion of triggered disclosure, where if you tell a story about your company, then I'm going to require more disclosure from you, is I think a way in which we can keep companies from telling fairy tales. From, so basically, it creates both more accountability and more relevance in disclosures. Now, I'm, I'm not sure that I will be able to sell the disclosure rule writers in any of these pitches, but I think it's worth thinking about. I hope you found the session useful, and I thank you very much for listening.